affordability and housing issues have been a major concern for many, many years for very low income, very low wage workers, but now even more middle income and higher income individuals struggle, and that becomes a bigger problem for economic growth and development for our state. All right, the folks with Housing RI. Uh, Stefan Pryor, our Housing Secretary, is in to react to that and other questions regarding the homeless and other uh, sort of issues on your plate. Stefan, welcome back. Nice Great to have to you. Great to be back, Gene. Thank you. Boy, I'll tell you, I don't remember a, a year that we have spoken about homelessness and affordable housing more than we have this year. Agreed. At least for the past nine months. Yes. It's just been nonstop. It's true. All right, what's the progress we've made? A lot of progress. We have a lot underway. We are getting programs going that help us build housing, mm -hmm. first and foremost. So. Uh, in one of my earliest board meetings with Rhode Island Housing, with credit to the agency itself, we approved 1,600 new units of housing, meaning we're helping to finance it. 1,400 of them are affordable to working folks and lower and moderate income folks. So we're getting that going. We're also creating new programs. Some of those programs help us invest directly in housing stock to write down the prices. Okay. But some of it, Gene, helps cities and towns break down the barriers to housing production. What does that mean? Sometimes if you can extend the water or sewer line or bring that roadway in, mm -hmm. a piece of land that can't be housing right. developed yep. can be for that purpose. So we have a new infrastructure fund of $4 million that helps with that. Other cities and towns tell us, I don't have a single planner. I don't have a single development professional on, on staff at town hall or city hall. Mm -hmm. Now we have a fellows program where we can help them build their capacity to get it done. So okay. it's all of those things. All right. So now, you know, we, we link these two issues together, affordable housing and homelessness. But they're two distinct issues because we know homelessness has a lot to do with drug addiction, a lot to do with mental health issues. Affordable housing is, I can't afford to live in this town. Can you please right. build me an apartment that I can afford so I can send my kids to a better school, correct? It's very true, yes. Right. And you know, on homelessness, there are folks experiencing homelessness in Rhode Island with all kinds of um, walks of life and descriptions in their lives. National data shows that maybe 20, 21% uh, experience mental health issues and maybe 16% uh, substance issues in the homeless population. There are also families who are living out of their cars because they're getting crowded out of this overheated housing market. So, and who have none of those problems. Yeah. So we've got to solve all this. We do have emergency solutions on the way, Gene. As we build this housing stock, we have to have a bridge to that future where we have more housing. So we have emergency solutions and it's three things. It's more shelter, mm -hmm. expansion, it's more ways of helping folks stay housed, that's prevention, and it's more partnerships with churches and synagogues and mosques and cities and towns, and that's collaboration. Okay, uh, let me just keep the two separate just for a second. We're gonna discuss homelessness at, at length, but with regard to affordable housing, you know, I had Mayor Policina Jr. in, not yes. that long ago, and I asked him about affordable housing, and he's kind of pushing it back against this notion that you're gonna come in and, and build affordable units in his town. He said, we're built out, and you know what? I'd like more affluent neighborhoods constructed. Let me listen to Mayor Policina Jr. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have that coming up in just a second. Sure. Before I do, let me listen to uh, Mayor Rivera from Central Falls. Very she was good. in with me last week. Week. And uh, well, let's listen and then I'm going to frame a question a certain way. Go ahead and play the mayor. It's a great big deal, right? There's a lot of new people coming into the city of Central yeah. Falls. There's a lot of people that are using the train. They're getting better jobs in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But it's also a challenge because I'm thinking about gentrification. You know, housing is a big deal right. for me. Affordable housing is a big deal for me. The rents are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Whatever thought that rents in Central Falls for a two bedroom would be like $1,600. That's a big deal. My families can't afford that, mm. which is why I've been so focused on affordable housing and trying to bring in more affordable housing because I know that we're going to continue receiving people from other parts who are, they can't afford to pay the 1600 but it's also kicking out the families who already live in the community. Very interesting what she said in it the is. train station. It is. She says it's bringing new people in. Yes. People with maybe a higher, uh, a higher income That's level. Right. But it's pushing out the traditional Central Falls resident. Now, right. let me just take a step back and say, Stefan, isn't it better if Central Falls becomes a more affluent community? Isn't that good that people with more money are coming in? It can be good. And I think that the challenge is balance. So in a Central Falls, we do want to bring in folks who are middle income, who can help to pay the taxes that sustain the services and all that kind of stuff. And the, the Central Falls Pawtucket train station, the MBTA mm. line that's so successful in that new stop is a catalytic uh, event for us. We might be able to build a lot of new, ho of new housing there, but Gene, we also do have to make sure it's not pure gentrification, that we're not crowding out ex existing mm. Central Falls residents. So how do we do that? We need to invest in affordable housing. 
there's a series of ways we're doing that. We can do mixed income housing in a place like this transit hub. We can invest with affordable housing tax credits. Until this past legislative session, we didn't have the affordable housing tax credit that the vast majority of the Northeast, six out of eight states have. have. It's called a low, low income housing tax credit, LIHTC. Now we do have that tax yeah. credit, up to $30 million a year to make more affordability happen. So we can do both. We can now afford to do both. And in a Johnston, I know that you were referring to Johnston. Yeah. I know a lot of folks are struggling with affordability. And in Johnston, it may be that what we need is that infrastructure money. What we need is that capacity yeah. in, in City Hall to get more housing built. Well, if Johnson says, you know, I'd like to be like East Greenwich or Barrington. I'd like to be an affluent community. So let me handle this. And I want to I want to see more luxury homes go up rather than affordable housing. Uh, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with more homes for people of means, mm -hmm. nothing at all. We need to build our tax base and at every single income level and at every price point of housing in mm -hmm. Rhode Island right now, people are not finding the product that they want, that they expect because that market is much too tight. We have the lowest housing production rate in America right now, worst of the 50. So housing for people of means is good, but also in Johnston, mm -hmm. how about the working folks who keep the town running we need to make sure that we have workforce housing and true affordable housing mm -hmm. for folks too. That's why we have these investment tools and that's why we're working with the League of Cities and Towns, Gene, to say to mayors and town managers, you tell us where it should be built. Where do you have the infrastructure? Where do you have the capacity? Where do you think it makes sense for your community fabric? And let's do it there. Uh, you know, this is an old uh, argument. You could have a philosophical argument, regulation versus let the market decide. So uh, could, could we frame it that way? You're with the government, you're regulating, you're insisting on affordable housing, you're encouraging, you're doing a carrot and stick versus the market will decide who gets to rent well, in a certain given it, community. It, it is both. Or, First, or live or buy a home. It's both. Two, two points about the market. I think our market is broken in certain ways in Rhode Island that we have to fix so that it functions efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the local planning, zoning, and development processes are zigzag processes mm -hmm. where approvals are hard to track. The thing that a private developer helps, hates the most, hates the most, Gene, is unpredictability. A market actor, a right. private sector business, wants predictability. So under Speaker Shikarshi, with definitive partnership mm -hmm. from the governor and the Senate president, we, we had 13 bills in this past session to make things more efficient and predictable. Right. The other way in which it's broken, I've mentioned it a couple times, is sometimes the infrastructure, that's the government's right. job, the water and sewer infrastructure, the, the power mm -hmm. lines may not be functioning in a way that let us build in a given place. That's the government's job to enable the market to do its job. And sometimes builders hate being told how many apartments they have to build to set aside for affordable housing. And sometimes neighborhoods uh, push back against affordable housing. You've seen that in some of the suburbs. Oh, for I sure. Take the last word before we go to break. Well, I think sometimes there are misperceptions like, you know, if we have new homes for families with children, it'll overburden the schools and it'll raise our taxes. One of the things our housing department, our brand new department wants to be a partner on is let's do the math. If there are going to be increased property taxes from new brick and mortar housing development mm -hmm. in a given place, maybe that those property taxes will more than offset the increase in per pupil expenses in the school system. So let's take a hard look and see if we can overcome some common and understandable misperceptions. The critics will say it's not enough, but by any measure, we have made progress. You're building developments too, I think, are going up in East Greenwich. Oh, yes. And East Bay, West Bay. Yes. You, uh, this has been pushed. It's been the issue yes. uh, of the year, and there is measurable progress. Urban, suburban, rural, we're getting it done. We have to do a lot more. All right, stay with us. Now let's talk about the homeless specifically when we come back with our Housing Secretary, Stephen Pryor. Let's continue with uh, Rhode Island Housing Secretary Stephen Pryor in for a second segment. Uh, Stephen, homelessness. Just the other day, they were picketing yes. and protesting Mayor Smiley. Uh, they're saying he's evicting the homeless encampments without having a place to them for them to go. You work with the mayor on this, and I guess they're criticizing you too. The answer to the homeless advocates would be? More shelter needs to be built to help the unsheltered. So we need to, all of us in Rhode Island, Mayor Smiley, but mayors and town managers across our 30, 39 cities and towns. We need to work to create new indoor spaces that are safe and warm during the winter. So uh, I think it's fair that there's advocacy for doing that. I also think we're getting there. So with help from different municipalities, we're getting there. Um, we're in Burrowville, we're in Warwick, we're in Westerly, we're in Providence, and we're in Pawtucket. 
we, we kept our bed strength strong coming out of last winter. Mm -hmm. So we had 1,052 beds, including the armory, coming out of last winter uh, that were shelter beds avail available to folks experiencing homelessness. We've worked very hard to identify new places for new and expanded shelters with all kinds of partners, and that includes the Catholic Diocese, and that includes right. civic groups, and that includes service providers, and now we're gonna be up by 318 beds on top of that number, 30% up, so that we can accommodate the hundreds of folks who are experiencing homelessness and are outdoors, Gene. Right. You have promised to do better this coming winter. Yes, you've, sir. You've made that clear, and so has the governor. But you know, these advocates, do you wanna push back on them? You are pretty patient with the encampments at the Da Vinci Center, two of them, and you've been, been, pretty, been pretty patient, but it doesn't sound like it's patient enough for them. Did well, they not I, want I, you to take any action to clear out the encampments? It's all about balance. We, we need to be professional and we need to care about the clients, meaning individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness are, not, are the truly vulnerable Rhode Islanders who are affected, and why are they living outdoors? In the vast majority of cases, they want housing, so they don't want to be there. And we have to be responsive to the community that rightly thinks that they need to have quality of life protected and preserved. So we have to have balance. So when an encampment arises, we need to have shelters and housing for folks. That's why we're building so much more and we're succeeding at it, but we have a lot more to do. And we have to do some other things. We need to give people adequate notice that they need to move. We need to help them store their belongings because these belongings for them, even if they're outdoors, may be the only things they have in the world. We need to try to bring civilians in and not police to have dialogue with them about the options available to them. So there's a way to do it in a balanced and proper and thoughtful and humane way. Well, but at a certain point, push does come to shove. It can. And if, it if came public, to that at if the public safety Center. is at And it risk. came to that near the, Mar near the Marriott where a, a, a man was camped out for months and months there and right across the street at the at the overpass. Now, he has since moved behind the mall, uh, and he doesn't want to leave. He wants to be left alone. What do you do with someone like that? Well, you need to try to present someone like that with real options that may be appealing on the merits to that person. So that person may, tr there are examples yeah. where people may truly prefer almost any option other than permanent housing. So look, we've got to produce more permanent supportive housing where it's not just yeah. a room, it's a room with supports, including mental health supports and supports related to addiction. We, ha we have to do that. Yeah. So uh, in the case of, I'm not gonna get into specific individuals, but I will say when someone is showing signs of behavioral health disorders, meaning yeah. that they have mental health issues or otherwise, we have folks from the offices of the Health and Human Services Division, HHS of our government, reach out or their delegates to provide those kinds of services, at least to offer them, right. that may be appealing. Okay, this uh, man, uh, by the way, he's been dubbed Marriott Man because he lived, or he was set up his camp over by the Marriott. He has since moved behind the mall, uh, the back end of the mall, the way you come into the garages. And the mayor told me just the other day on the radio, he's getting complaints now from the 903. So it's yes. an open question as to whether, how long you're gonna let him stay there. Um, but with regard to some of the other homeless uh, people, they want hotel rooms now. They don't want shelters. And I've heard that persistently. Well, what they think shelters are too big, they're too right. noisy, they're too crowded, they're not safe. And you're telling me the state's going to open more shelters, we're going to buy the buildings. Well, we're doing a variety of things. It is true that the average person, homeless or not homeless, uh, the average person prefers his or her own room with a door and a lock and some privacy and the ability to conduct your life. Mm -hmm. And some, in some cases, folks are getting their lives back on track. So, of course, that's true rather than what they call congregate shelter. Yeah or a lot of beds in a given space, in, you know, in a given room. So we are working to provide more of those. For example, we're purchasing the Charles Gate, okay. which is a former nursing home in Providence. It's still in process, but we're very far along with the negotiation. That will let us ha have more individual rooms okay. for families. It's, it's a good example. Up in Burrowville, on a temporary basis, we're on the campus of Zamborano, opening up some cottages with mm -hmm. individual rooms for families experiencing okay. homelessness and their children. So, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a shelter, but yes. it's, more, it's more like a hotel setting. The state is getting into the homeless hotel business. We're, You're buying these, they're gonna be individual rooms. You think that's well, the solution? I do, I do think it's better to have privacy and to treat people humanely, but I also think that what we should do with these properties, if we buy them, mm -hmm. is that we should convert them into housing. First, deal with the emergency, get folks in, have it be temporary housing, right. 
but then let's convert it into permanent supportive housing so folks can live there long term. That you're, would be the ideal. You're talking millions, and that's all right. The state's yes. going to spend millions. You're committed to this, and the governor told me the very same thing. When I first had you in mm -hmm. as our new housing secretary, mm -hmm. I said, do you want an audit? Mm -hmm. Because we've thrown a lot of millions. Yes at advocacy groups, at crossroads. Mm -hmm. Where has it all gone? We're at mm -hmm. a crisis mm -hmm. now. Yes. Where's all the, where have all those millions gone? Do you want that audit? Are you doing an audit? You, you, you remember my response. I know you think with precision, and you remember I said, I'm going to conduct an assessment of what we're doing internal to government as well as what we're spending externally. Mm -hmm. That's what I said in response to you, and we've absolutely taken that seriously. We're doing that. A few things. First, when I came into office immediately with the partnership of the Rhode Island Foundation, which mm -hmm. funded it, we had the Boston Consulting Group, or BCG, come in and do an eight-week sprint of an analysis of everything we're doing, how the government okay. structures need to be improved, how the programs need to be improved, how the, how the vendors need to do their work better. We're also working with the continuum of care on a continuing monitoring approach of the performance of, especially in the housing domain, mm -hmm. our homeless service providers. We're also evaluating the coordinated entry system, that's the way that homeless right. folks queue up. We're evaluating that system and its data system. So we're all over it. Mm -hmm. And now we have a new way that we're offering our solicitation for services and offering okay. our funding to vendors where there's more data requirements I've got and we the, can evaluate even more going forward. Thanks, Stefan. I've got to hold it there. We'll have you in again. I'll have you on the radio. Continue this ongoing conversation. But thanks for coming in now. Thank you very much, Gene.